Welcome to Integrative Lawyers of the World, where we interview and have conversations with lawyers from all around the world who are practicing law in a new way, a way that honors our interconnectedness and that values authenticity, courage, and honesty. Our conversation this episode is with Tanya Lott from the Philippines. She's a law professor and a consultant and a member of the Integrated Law Movement. I look forward to our conversation with her, as I hope you do too. And if you want to check out other conversations with other lawyers from around the world, go to www.integrativelaw.com. And now for our conversation with Tanya. Hi, Tanya. Thank you so much for being part of Integrative Law um, and, and, and Integrative Lawyers from the World. Um, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me on the show, Carrie. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, why don't we start with you just sharing a little bit about your journey in the legal profession and your journey with Integrative Law? Okay. Um, well, I became a lawyer in 2002, so I've always wanted to be a lawyer because my father's a lawyer, and I grew up with his stories, um, you know, him discussing his cases over dinner, um, him telling us about, you know, his clients, the challenges of appearing in court, that kind of thing, and that set me off on my journey, and um, so after college, I Worked for a bit, then went to law school, and I was a working student. I was working for my father uh, for pretty much the whole of my stay in law school. Uh, took the bar, passed it in 2002. Then I worked for a, a big law firm for a couple of years. Then I realized it wasn't for me. Was your father, was he a litigator? You said he talk, would talk about his stories in court. So was he a litigator? Yes, uh, he was a litigator, but he was also an insurance lawyer. So he would, he would go to court only for the cases that he needed to, but um, he was a negotiator. Um, he could, you know, structure deals, um, okay. you know, do settlements so that things would end up in court. So then when you were working with his firm while you were in law school, you got exposure to both in the courtroom or courtroom litigation as well as negotiation and other um, transactional matters? Yes, uh, a lot of negotiation. So um, he's an insurance adjuster. So Part of his cases involved dealing with claimants, you know, trying to convince them to accept a particular claim, yeah. uh, trying to meet halfway, that kind of thing. So I got I got exposed to negotiation in that area. Okay, so then you go into law school and then you um, graduate past the bar and you're working with a large firm. What type of law were you doing in that large firm? I was with the corporate um, and special projects division. Um, but I also had some litigation cases. So um, as was the practice in that particular firm, we did rotation among the different departments before deciding on where we wanted to end up. Okay. And, and so I chose corporate and special projects, but I did get to keep my litigation cases. And so I got to meet and work with uh, different divisions, which had very, very different cultures, actually. Um, what was interesting, actually, is that I, I enjoyed the corporate and special projects work because it wasn't litigation. It wasn't confrontational. Um, it's like we were building things, um, you know, negotiating, putting things together, that kind of thing. But interestingly enough, the culture within the office was quite toxic. Mm. Very competitive, you know, mean girls, that kind of thing. Because really? we mostly girls. Yeah. Yeah. And ironically, in the litigation department, they were a lot more fun. You know, um, everyone was equal. We hung out with each other. We were friends, you know, and it, I, I, you know, come to think of it, that was very ironic, you know, in an adversarial field. There was a lot of love in that department. You know, you know I so my background is in litigation and part of it, I had a love hate relationship Um Love in terms of the action items, I kind of I kind of enjoyed it going into the court and coming up with the arguments. Um, love in the fact with every firm that I worked at with my peers and my coworkers, I always had very great relationships with and dear friendships that I'm still mm -hmm. friends with today today. The hate was just seeing the toxicity of the process on clients and on the cases, mm -hmm. and it just didn't seem to uh, make sense. 
But with regard to the friendship and litigation, I think there's something about being part of that system with others who understood what you're going through. Like we could, it developed a bond. And I think, how do I say this? Because I, sometimes I think other people, other non-litigators can get their feathers ruffled a little bit easier than mm -hmm. litigators can. So um, not that we were insensitive, but in my experience with the firms and the litigators, that we could roll with the punches a little bit easier. And I think that helped the friendships. Is that what kind of what you experience? I think so. I think so. Um, that particular firm was notorious for working really long hours. You know, uh, you know, workaholics. <laughs> Pretty much everyone was workaholic. But what was remarkable about the litigation department, how it was run, was that um, the, the chief, um, the, the partner, the, man, the partner in charge of litigation, he was really a team player. And it's like, he would stay late. You know, it's like he would be um, the first in the office and the last to leave, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, he would work his people hard, but he would also, you know, treat them well. So it's like, um, you know, he'd take people out for drinks, for dinner, that kind of thing. Um, everyone would be relaxed. And then after that, okay, guys, back to work. <laughs> and, you know, working from 10, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. But, you know, it's like, you know, the partner wouldn't leave until everyone had gone home, you know, that kind of thing. So I think he was really modeling a kind of culture that was very healthy. You know, it, it was really a team effort. Uh, no one left behind. Uh, everyone was taken care of. Um, and it's, it's a pity that that culture didn't translate to the other department where I was with. Um, it was pretty much like, um, you know, I was at the bottom of the food chain. Mm -hmm. um, we would go out for dinner, you know, and it's like I'd have to come back to the office and finish the work while everyone else would go home. You know, things like that. You, you know, yeah. it just... Yeah, <laughs> it's frustrating. I do know that it is. You know, yeah. I would hate it when I worked at the firm and on the off chance that you left at 630 or 7 p.m., which was a very rare thing. And someone would look at you That's and weird. say, oh, you're working a half day. I'm like, I've already worked 11 yeah. hours today. No, it's not a half day. But, you know, it, it was still unusual. But the expectation was, how dare you even think about leaving before 10 p.m. at night? There's another law firm um, where one of the partners eventually became um, a justice of our Supreme Court, and he was even chairman of the WTO appellate body. Um, it's, it's firm lore that you don't want to run into him in the elevator as you're on your way home. So it's like, it's 9 p.m., it's time to go home. You've already worked more than 12, 14 hours. And it's like, he'll accost you and say, why are you going home? It's still early. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People would like, I can imagine scenes like if it was a TV sitcom series where you would see like the, the associates like hiding around the corner behind like a plant <laughs> to wait for this yeah. partner to leave. Yeah. Um, so you were in the uh, corporate, and corporate and Special Projects Division. Uh, did you enjoy the type of work that you were doing and it was, but the, there wasn't a sense of teamwork? Um, I, I enjoyed the work, but it got to the point where I realized that I was just looking forward to evenings and weekends. Mm. I was no longer happy coming to work. Uh, I dreaded waking up in the morning because it meant having to go to work. And then I realized that something's not right here. You know, I can't just keep postponing my, my joy until the end of the day or the end of the week or for vacations. You know? So at that point, I already knew that it was time to go. And um, I'm a spiritual person and I ask for signs. So I, I asked, I told God, I, I told God, um, God, I know that it's time for me to leave. I mean, I know I should leave. I know I should leave the firm, but tell me when. You know? So I asked for a sign on when would be the right time to leave. Uh, and it was such a dramatic sign. But that's yeah. a, another story altogether. <laughs> Wait, it was a dramatic sign or it was not a dramatic sign? It was. It was a very oh. dramatic sign. Well, now we need yeah. to hear this. So if, if you're open to sharing it, if not, it's okay. okay. <laughs> sure, sure. No problem. So, um, so the sign I asked for was like white roses. And so white roses are associated with um, St. Therese of the Child Jesus. Yeah. And... I was attending the baptismal party of my, of my um, godchild, 
and it was a big thing, you know, it was a big ballroom. And so anyway, um, I was seated at the table and I greeted one of my, my friends who had come in. And then I said, oh, do you want to go to another table? And she said, she said no, just let's come back to the table where you were originally. So sat down there. And then I happened to tell her about my unhappiness at work. And I said, I'm just waiting for a sign. And she said, oh, what sign are you waiting for? And I said, white roses. And she pointed to me, oh, do you mean that one? It was like the centerpiece was white roses and I had totally ignored it. Yeah. And it was like out of the entire ballroom, there were several tables in that whole ballroom. There were only two tables which had roses. Everything else had different centerpieces. Really? I yeah. love that yeah. story. I love that one, the white roses were there. And sometimes the signs are there for us, but sometimes we need someone to help guide us and show us, hey, look, there's the sign. Yes, exactly. And here's the thing. I didn't believe it yet. Mm -hmm. So that was on a Saturday. The following Saturday was my birthday. And you know, I, it was a practice in the firm that they would schedule a board meeting or a department meeting on someone's birthday so that, you know, it was an excuse to charge, you know, it was a legitimate meeting, but at the same time, you know, it was socials as well. So, so they scheduled something at this really swanky country club on my birthday, you know, and I thought, oh, wow, okay, is it, are, they, are they surprising me or something? But during that whole time, there's no mention at all of my birthday. And then at some point, I was even taken aside by one of the partners saying that the other associates were complaining about me, that kind of thing, that I'm not a team player or something like that, you know. So I just took it all in stride, but I was starting to feel bad. So anyway, and I know she meant well, you know, she had a very motherly demeanor and she, you know, she, she was good to me when I was at the firm. So I knew she was just, you know, trying to convey this feedback to me. So at the end of our conversation, and everyone else was already going, you know, they were already swimming, they were, you know, it was at the country block. You know, I told her, um, I'll, I'll have to leave already. Uh, and by the way, it's my birthday. <laughs> you know, and it was like, you know, just utter shock on her face. Like, oh my God, it's your birthday. So she called the other partners and, you know, told them, it's Tanya's birthday. It's Tanya's birthday. And it's like, you know, and it's like, I had to leave. And then one of the partners called me as I was on my way out, you know, and she said, I'm heading back to the office. Would you like to ride with me? That kind of thing. Of course, it was, you know, they're trying to do damage control. Mm -hmm. And it's like I said, I just made up a story. I said, oh, I already have a ride, <laughs> even though I'm just still walking out. Yeah. And at the end of that phone call, it's like tears streaming down my face. It's like, yep, Lord, it's time to go. <laughs> it's time to go. And then when you had that realization, the tears are streaming down your face. But after that realization, how did you feel? Um, I felt bad, of course. Um, I didn't show up for work that following Monday. You know, I, I said I was sick. <laughs> Everyone, of course, knew that that was not true. And when I came back on Tuesday, it was just a, such an awkward silence. You know, it's like, you know, my colleagues didn't know how to relate to me. You know, it was just very, very yeah. awkward. And so I, I tendered my resignation that Friday. I mean, I did my work and stuff. And that Friday, I tendered my resignation. And I, I handed it in to my, to my to the partner who I was closest to and who was my professor in law school. Uh, she was the one who brought me into the firm. You know, it was like I was her mentee. You know, yeah. she was training especially. And she just exploded. And she was just really angry. It's like, what? We're losing you, you know? And she was saying, oh, that mean, those mean girls in your department, you know, that kind of thing. So they were willing to make accommodations, actually, to keep me in the firm. You know, they were even saying like, oh, um, you don't have to have a senior associate monitor your work. You know, you can report directly to the partners, you know, that kind of thing, you know? And it's like, I, I mean, I could see what they were trying to do, but at the same time, I knew that it would just breed more resentment yeah. among the others, you know. So I said, no, I, I have to go. When you handed in your resignation, did you have a plan in place? Did you have another job lined up? Did you have any feelers out? Um, I did take a long vacation after that. So I, you know, I'd saved up my money. Um, and I, I was able to get sponsorship to the International Bar Association Conference. So they have a program for young scholars, you know, it's like for the young lawyers. So I, I managed to get that scholarship. It was an all expense paid um, thing to the conference. The registration fee was free, hotel, um, you know, living expenses were taken care of. That is amazing. So let's repeat this again in case there's any other young lawyers out there, because I never knew about opportunities like that. What did you have to do to qualify for the scholarship? 
Um, well, we didn't have to do anything. I mean, it, it was a young scholars kind of thing in the sense that um, they wanted to attract young lawyers into the association. Mm-hmm. So if you'd been in the practice for less than seven years, uh, you could qualify. And so I was with lawyers from Malaysia, from Indonesia, you know, different parts of the world. I think it was mostly for um, people from developing countries yeah. uh, and people who wouldn't normally get to attend these conferences because mm-hmm. IBA conferences are very prestigious and very expensive. You know, but um, uh, and it so happened that it was held in New Zealand. Oh, beautiful. Because yeah, it was just really fantastic. So after the conference, I uh, stayed on for two more weeks. Um, I backpacked um, across New Zealand together with um, two lawyers that I had met at the conference and we're still friends to this day. It was fantastic. Wow, you met them at the conference then ended up backpacking with them for two weeks. What a, I love yeah. experiences like that. Was there anything about attending the conference itself that um, helped you as you went on to further your law practice? Um, it opened my eyes to how many diverse fields of law there are. Ah, yeah. It's like, and that's something about the International Bar Association. Um, I got to attend the New Zealand conference and then the Prague conference the following year, another beautiful city. Um, that time it was just um, a half scholarship. So it was like, I had to take care of my living expenses, but the registration was still free. It was essentially like a two-year two thing. Um, but it's like, I felt like a kid in a candy store. Yeah. You know, there are so many sessions, meetings, um, lectures, panels going on at the same time. And I mean, you did have the hardcore mergers and acquisitions, you know, corporate law kind of thing. But you also had, of course, human rights. You had entertainment law, art law. Um, and just really, just really fascinating, you know, so many areas um, where a lawyer can practice, really. Which ones were you drawn to? Because um, I, I've, I've been interested in indigenous people's law, um, because we have a lot of indigenous peoples here in the Philippines. So I was attracted to that. Um, when I was in Prague, I remember attending the one, um, there was a panel on Franz Kafka, uh, who was a lawyer and who wrote all of these um, stories about the law. And, and I thought that was fascinating, you know, yeah. to be in Prague, in the city where Franz Kafka lived, and, you know, and you get to understand, oh, so this, this was his context, because he was writing in this area, and this is what the environment is like, you know? It's just fascinating. So how did you first discover integrative law? I think I might have heard about it at, at, at the conference. I, I don't remember anymore where, but... Um, because I, I did my master's at Georgetown. So I was in the United States for two years. So you did a master's of law in Georgetown. What was the focus on? Um, I majored in international legal studies because I was litigating a case at the time. And um, it was basically, there, so there was a treaty that we had entered into with Japan. And we were concerned that the treaty would be used to legalize um, dumping of Japan's toxic waste in the Philippines. So we, we mounted a resistance. We tried to oppose the, the passage of that treaty, the ratification of the treaty in Congress. Um, and then when that went through, we went to the Supreme Court, filed the case. So I went to Georgetown actually because my, so my, my mentor who went on to become Chief Justice of the Philippines, um, she had trained under Professor John Jackson when she was doing her own master's in Michigan. And I had learned, I felt that I had learned everything I could learn from her. And I said, I need to learn more if we're going to win this case. And she said, oh, you have to learn from my teacher then. You know? And so John Jackson was, was at Georgetown. He had moved from Michigan to Georgetown. And so that was the logical uh, choice. So when you went to Georgetown to learn from the mentor of your mentor, it was part of a way to help you with this international dispute that you were working on. Yes, that's right. Okay. And when you say we, who were you with at that time? Was this when you were at the large law firm or is this after that? It was after that. So earlier you asked me if I had a, a, black, a backup, backup plan or a safety mm-hmm. net. I didn't have a safety net. So after backpacking in New Zealand, I came back, you know, tried to figure out the rest of my life. And then um, it turns out, so, so my mentor at the law firm, the one who didn't want to see me again, um, turns out that her godmother, so she was a political activist, so they ran in the same circles. 
So her godmother, um, who was a, politi- a very highly respected human rights activist, approached her saying that, um, can you help us? We need a lawyer for the political party that I'm part of. Um, and she, and my mentor, her name is Susan. She said, oh, um, Tanya, it turns out they talked about it before I left the firm. You know, she said, Tanya's on her way out from the firm. Catch her when she leaves, you know. So there was that. So after I got back, uh, they got in touch with me uh, and they said, can you be part of our legal team? So these are, um, this is left of center. This is, um, it's called Akbayan. Um, so this is um, a political party that emerged after the Marcos dictatorship. So you had the whole communist movement and then you had, you know, you had a spectrum. So you had the extreme left who still believed in, you know, militancy, um, armed struggle. And then you had those who wanted to be more moderate. And they said, um, let's engage the mainstream, um, you know, the mainstream political system. Let's participate in elections. Let's form political parties and run. Uh, and so it was that, that particular group. So it was relatively young. It was less than 10 years old when I joined them. Uh, and I was very fortunate to be part of this really young dynamic group of lawyers who, you know, were really social justice advocates, who really loved the country and really, you know, wanted to help, you know, the, the Filipino people. So um, it was in that context. Um, so I was doing legislative work because some of them were in Congress and I was advising them on, you know, WTO matters, trade, investment. Um, and we were also looking into these areas like, can people have a say in international treaties such as this, you know? And, you know, Akbayan, it's a progressive political party. And one of the main principles is that people matter. People should participate in the process. And we actually do have a provision in our constitution where people should participate in economic, political, uh, and social decision-making. So we tried to test that theory by pushing for our participation in the negotiations. You know, so we were trying to advance this new way of looking at things that it's not only the senators, it's not only the, the diplomats and the foreign uh, service people who should be involved in the negotiations. Ordinary people should have a say in what goes into these treaties, um, and especially when it affects the health and the environment. How would that happen? How can you have ordinary people have a say or a voice into what actually goes into those treaties? It makes sense to me that they should and that they do, but just as a matter of logistics, it seems like it would be, how do you do that? So one way we, we tried to do that, so we had representatives in Congress. So in the Philippines, it's only the Senate which ratifies treaties. Um, during, during that time, we tried to push the envelope so there, there was a committee in Congress, which um, it's a special committee on globalization. And so they tried to open an investigation, you know, a, 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 inqui- um, a legislative inquiry um, into the, the, the treaty negotiation. So they, they summoned the people from the Department of Trade. They summoned people from the Department of Foreign Affairs to give information about the treaty so that, you know, Congress could weigh in. And uh, we actually also got some inf- inside information from people. Um, I can disclose this already because the people <laughs> concerned are no longer there. Um, but basically, they, they leaked information to us because they were, um, they were private lawyers who were hired by the government to be part of the negotiating team. Uh, they did not like how it was going because it was basically like a silo mentality kind of thing. It was like um, the trade people only negotiated trade, um, the you know, the services people only negotiated services. Um, So it was a very, you know, very silo mentality. And no one could see the whole, that kind of thing. And um, so Justice Feliciano, um, he was was the the one I was telling you about, the the one who became a Supreme Court justice and was with the WTO. And the one who said, it's too early for you to be going home at 9 o'clock in the morning, at 9 (laughs) p.m. You know, that's him. That's him. Brilliant man. Very, very brilliant man. Um, he was on, on the negotiating team for one chapter, and he was very alarmed at how the Philippine government was going about it. You know, there's something terribly wrong with this. And he also saw that the, that the negotiators were only too willing to bend to Japan's wishes. It's like when you're negotiating for your country, you're supposed to be standing up for your country's interests, right? But here, 
they were only too happy to give the Japanese what they wanted, you know. And that's one of the failings of the Filipinos. We are too accommodating to foreigners, and we sometimes sacrifice our self-interest too much just to please the other, yeah. thinking that that's what's going to be good for us, you know. So one one particularly troublesome point about the treaty was that there were indications that there were intentions to smuggle in or to bring in toxic waste. Um, and this was not without precedent. Um, in 2000, Japan had tried to bring in like several containers full of trash, like household trash, you know, um, soiled diapers, um, you know, really yucky stuff. You know, it's not stuff that you can recycle. So there were indications from the treaty that that was going to happen. And it was small things like um, waste, 0% tariff. Uh, there was an entire chapter on definitions of waste. What are the different kinds of waste? You know, So for people who are only looking at one section of the treaty and not looking at the entire treaty as a whole, it seems harmless. But, you know, but people, you know, people like Justice Feliciano knew better that you have to have the whole, you have to look at the whole and not just at separate parts, you know. So he was feeding that information to us, giving us questions to ask at the congressional hearings. And, you know, we were also pushing freedom of information, pushing government to release information that should not be classified, that kind of thing. So we were able to piece the story together. And we actually were able to, to get a victory, um, even though the, the Senate ratified you know, the, the agreement eventually. We made so much noise. It was really such a media spectacle. We would have rallies every day, um, and it would always be this media event. There's always a photo of some creative thing that would land us on the front page of the papers. You know? So really drumming up interest uh, and concern about the issue. Um, and we were the, the victory that we were able to secure was Japan had to issue diplomatic notes assuring us that they would not send us their waste. So they didn't they didn't really change the terms of the treaty, but they it was a side note which essentially was like an addition to the treaty, acknowledging the problem and saying that we won't do that. So it wasn't exactly what we wanted, but it was a victory nonetheless. Nicely done. Thank you. And um, I was also able to get feedback from Professor Jackson. So when I was enrolled in his class, you know, the case was ongoing. We were filing pleadings. Um, I just really got a kick out of putting on the last line of the pleading, um, you know, City of Manila and Washington, D.C. You know, to indicate where it was, you know, where it was coming from. So it's just, you know, so just that, <laughs> just got the kick out of that. And um, what was vindication for me was that I was testing my theory you know, I consulted Professor Jackson and I submitted the paper in his class, basically analyzing the agreement. And essentially, he confirmed that, yes, your, your analysis is correct. So that was nice. You were able to uh, test it in the class. And then was that used as the basis for your argument in the brief submitted in the tribunal? Yes, wow. it was. It was. Yeah. And I got best paper <laughs> for, that, for that paper as well. <laughs> well, congratulations on that as well. Um, so you can see how that kind of is tied into an awareness of integrative law where you have, when they're looking at this treaty, how you're saying you need to have a holistic approach to this. I just wanted to share because Justice Feliciano, uh, during his time at the World Trade Organization, so there's this famous case called the Shrimp Turtle Case, um, which he penned. And basically, um, it was groundbreaking in international law because this was the World Trade Organization. And usually, it's a silo mentality as well. It's like, this is trade. We only apply rules of trade. If it's a human rights tribunal, we only apply principles of human rights. Mm -hmm. And Justice Feliciano was one of the first people to say, no, we apply public international law. And public international law should include everything. So you look at human rights, you look at environmental law, you look at trade law. They're not supposed to be um, read separately. You have to take them all together. So he was saying that environmental norms about protection of, you know, um, you know the species, um, they have to be read into trade agreements. You cannot just isolate them from each other. So in, in a way, Justice Feliciano was practicing integrated law, uh, even though it was, he wouldn't have known to call it that at the time. 
I mean, it makes sense because if an economic policy or economic trade deal is going to affect the way that people live, or you could see how it's going to affect their their rights, um, it's going to affect the environment. So it only makes sense that you would have to look at them all together. We are taking a brief break from this conversation to ask for your financial support. With each episode, we hope you can see how lawyers and peacemakers like you are contributing to the healing of the world. It takes many kinds of resources for the integrative law movement to keep going and affecting change. Your monetary donation can help us continue this important work by supporting the activities and members of this community. Each contribution goes to promote the stability and accessibility of the movement and to support basic expenses like our mighty network group, web hosting, social media and event management, and this Integrative Lawyers of the World podcast. Because we like to give people choices, we have ongoing monthly options on patreon.com where you can choose a level of participation to match your budget. You can also make a one-time donation through PayPal. Thanks to our non-profit corporate sponsors, the Renaissance Lawyer Society, US supporters are able to make tax-deductible donations. Other countries check your local tax laws. To help establish confidence in your choices to support us, we have set up an open collective, transparent plan to track how the community money is spent. For ways to support the integrative law movement and our world-changing work, go to the Integrative Law website at integrativelaw.com and click on Support the Movement tab. Search for Integrative Law on Patreon or use the phrase Integrative Law Financial Support for the Movement in your favourite search engine. Thank you for your support and spending time with us today. Enjoy the rest of this conversation. Is that now a norm in international law cases to read all of public international law in a dispute and not just one aspect of it? Not yet. Not yet. It's still admittedly the minority view, but an international development that may be of interest um, they're now reopening the discussions on the um, right to development. So there's a draft convention on the right to development. And um, a good friend of mine was recently appointed um, chair rapporteur. So she's a young academic based in, uh, at Notre Dame in the US. And uh, she has been working on this treaty for a long time. And I, I'm just beginning to appreciate her work so she has worked in international trade and investment. So it's, you know, it's a, it, and she's, um, she's an economics major. She graduated summa cum laude from her department uh, in economics and um, also on top of her class in law school. And that's her field. And she's been doing human rights work. And her own um, philosophy basically is that human rights law has to be read into economic law. It has to be read into trade and investment law. Um, and ultimately, um, it's very fitting. So the right to development basically puts the human person at the center of development. You know, and international law generally has, you know, it makes a distinction between objects and subjects of international law, like indigenous peoples. Uh, they're usually objects or something or subjects. And what the right to development is now pushing for is that the human person should be at the center of development not a mere passive beneficiary or recipient of development, but an active participant. So um, I'm working on a paper right now yeah. um, on that. Um, so the right to development includes the right to participate in decision-making. You know, so basically, if something is going to affect your life, you should have a say, whether that is um, a road that's going to be constructed in your area, uh, whether it's... Um, a public a law that's going to affect your income or affect taxes uh, or even you know the current vaccine mandates you know something that's going to be injected into your body um, and which, which is supposed to protect uh, the community from COVID-19 you know um, and yeah and, and basically um, for me I think it's a very very welcome development especially at this, this time of COVID where everything is pretty much falling apart um, and we're seeing that the old command and control ways of doing things are not working. So what if, what if people had a more active role? What if people could have a say in something that will affect their lives 
directly? What if you ask people what their ideas are? I think it sounds beautiful in concept and in values. I am 100% on board with it. Where my concern is, I don't, um, there's so much misinformation out there. And if people are participating on misinformation or lies or facts, but they don't have the time to do all the underlying research to know what is what, um, is that really an informed participation? And how do we, in, how do we, in, how do we ensure that in the process? Well, we have to have a process, of course. You know, so I wouldn't say that um, you know people ranting on Facebook is people's participation. Yeah, you, know, you will need to have mechanisms by which you will have honest brokers facilitate the dialogue. You yeah, know, you need to have a group that will hear both sides. You will need to have um, you know a, a dispassionate, objective group um, able to sift through the information with as little bias as possible. You know, um, I, I really feel strongly against censorship. Um, there was a time really, because we have a lot of this information right now. Um, we're preparing for elections next year. And um, the son of Ferdinand Marcos is running again. And it's really a lot of this information, really. You know, they're, it's historical revisionism. They're changing the facts. They're using photos from Thailand to show that there are people rallying in his support. You know, there's a lot of that. You know? It's just... And, horrible how that I mean and I think it's the world over that you see that and it's it's so hard to fight because you say yeah the Facebook rantings don't count as participation really but they do and they do affect the way people vote exactly no I I just wanted to say that um I I did feel there was a there was a point I was thinking about you know censorship yeah maybe you should you should screen those things but then I realized, you know, with, with the vaccine mandates, for example, now, you're seeing that there's legitimate information that's being discredited, uh, being labeled as fake news by so-called fact checkers, you know, and it raises the question, who watches the watchers? Yeah. Who, who fact checks the fact checkers, you know? So maybe, maybe the answer is not censorship, but more information, you know? Maybe it's really, you, you get all that information out there and... I mean, ideally, people are smart enough or, or think critically enough to sift through the information. Um, and having someone do the thinking for someone else is very dangerous. It is. It is dangerous. And I think that um, I, but it is helpful to have a maybe facilitated conversations with people who are guiding it in such a way that at least acknowledge where their bias is and maybe you have a few facilitators in the room coming from different perspectives. So there it's open and transparent and can be checked. Um, it's a little overwhelming and daunting when you say, well, yes, more information, but there's so much information out there now that people's ability to process it, I think gets minimized. And then I, at a time that, yeah, and then at a time where I think our critical thinking skills are going down because of the education. So, um, so I guess this is a call to yes, let's still focus on our critical thinking. Let's get those out there and have the facilitated conversations, um, and have you know, and now for the consumers, for consumers to watch and be engaged in a panel discussion where there's not yelling, where there's not name calling, where there's not hyperbole, give those shows ratings. And the shows that go to hyperbole and name calling and criticism, let's stop watching them. I agree. And, and that's, that's the challenge that we have. Like, for example, um, so I'm, I'm currently involved in, you know, the current debate on the mandatory vaccination kind of thing, because our government's really pushing towards mandatory vaccination. And What's really objectionable basically is that they're not giving people a choice. You know, they're not informing people about the adverse effects. They're not really giving people a choice. You know, it's like, it's, it's absolute, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it's, it's really very challenging. And, you know, it's like when you're, when you're pushed to the wall, you know, you know, emotions are heightened, 
you know, there's a tendency to want to lash out, to fight back, you know, and it's a natural human tendency. And, you know, part of my challenge really is telling, reminding people, you know, they're not the enemy. Or it's like they're pitting the vaccinated against the unvaccinated, you know. Yeah. I tell people, you know, they're not the enemy. I, I do know because I'm unvaccinated. I don't intend to get vaccinated because I, I, I have read my own reasons. I do have friends who are human rights lawyers who've been vaccinated who don't agree. They don't agree that it should be forced. They're saying that that's basic human rights. You shouldn't force someone to do something against their will. And especially if it can have long-term effects on their health, which the government will not compensate them for, you know. So, and part of the training right now is how do you respond, for example, to the government or to your employer or to your school? You know, how do you engage them in a way that does not resort to name calling or does not blame them? You know, how do you reach out to them in a way that is compassionate, that is loving and acknowledges that they want the same thing, that we all want the same thing. We want to go back to normal. We want people to be free of COVID. We want people to be healthy. You know, and we just have different ideas of how to go about it. You know, so it, it's a challenge to engage in this kind of dialogue when tensions are high, uh, and you know, we feel like we have to hunker down in our positions and convince the other that we're right and they're wrong. And I think it is something. It's just one of many areas where humanity needs to come together, um, and to embody some of the things that you were talking about: critical thinking, human rights. Um, holistic view of everything, of different issues. What does being an integrative lawyer or what does integrative law mean to you? For me, it means looking at the law holistically, um, realizing that the law is a tool for good and being able to use the law to not only solve people's problems, but also to heal them. Um, I was really struck by what um, Kim said in her book, you know, lawyers as peacemakers. And then there are chapters about lawyers as healers. Um, I'm a Reiki practitioner and I've also done Kundalini yoga and I teach meditation to my students, you know. Um, I and think when you I'm, say students, are you talking about law students? Yes. So you teach students, meditation so. to your law students. Wonderful. Yeah, so I, I always start every class with a meditation, whether I'm teaching a freshman class, a sophomore class, or you know, a, a masteral class. I always do meditation. And even for, for CLE, continuing legal education, uh, I, I try to inject meditation because um, I also teach ethics. So I, I tell my students, it's hard to think critically when your mind is racing or your emotions are high. You know, you need to be able to step back. You need to be able to quiet down. And that's where the wisdom can surface, you know. Um, plus, there's also a practical reason for that. I usually come after a, a very toxic or heavy subject. And so they're not in the best state of mind when they come to my class. So I have to kind of normalize them. Um, but but they really appreciate it. You know, they they some of them, for some of them, it's new, meditation is new, and it gives them a tool to manage their anxiety and their their stress. Have you been in any international negotiations or meetings where at the start of the meeting, everyone did like a two to five minute meditation uh, just at the start? No, uh, that usually happens if it's like an international yoga conference. Or uh, yeah, no. But why just the yoga conference? Imagine um, in your dispute in the Philippines dispute with Japan, when you're discussing that at the at COP26, I mean, I think we could all benefit from a moment of stillness before we discuss these things. I agree. I agree. Um, I'm trying to introduce that in, in the office. So I'm graduate program coordinator of our Master of Laws program at the University of the Philippines. And I, I do meditations at the start of our staff meetings. And um, after that, we do a check-in. And it's yeah, it, it, they, they really appreciate it. So it's, it really cements the bond, it gets them quiet, and, and the staff really appreciate not having to think about work or the concerns of the day for a few minutes. Oh, at one point you were talking about how you viewed integrative law as a consciousness. Can you talk about that a little bit more? It's something that I'm just starting to explore, and I'm currently doing that with Amanda Lamorne. 
So she has a Legal Light Workers Academy program. And um, I'm doing it together with Kristen Bolt right now. And um, we're exploring consciousness. And um, the current consciousness of the law is, you know, law is adversarial. It's about me versus them. Um, and, you know, and the, ho the whole dysfunction, I think, of the current legal system, you know, where you have lawyers who are very antagonistic towards each other, um, you know, mirroring the conflicts of their clients or not, or not modeling a better way of dealing with the situation, you know, for their clients. Um, you know, the eat what you kill system, mm -hmm. that, that's how you describe it in the US, um, shark lawyering, um, lawyers as the lowest form of life, yeah. that kind of thing. you know, so it's, it's not a really good rap. And Filipino lawyers are not much better, you know. Um, it's like lawyers are perceived to be liars, uh, manipulators of the truth, you know, that kind of thing. And I think it stems from a consciousness that, you know, it's a win-lose kind of thing. Um, if I'm going to win, you have to lose, you know. And it's a um, very adversarial survival mode. It's also founded on fear. It's founded on control and domination. And, and I think integrated law as a consciousness is moving away from that, realizing that you don't have to lose just because I win. We can win together. Um, we can disagree, but we can find common areas of agreement and from there try to find solutions which address our, our different interests. Um, in the area of divorce or you know, family law, um, we can separate, we can part ways, but it doesn't mean that we have to be enemies. We can still be friends. Um, I, I've seen this, um, Vishen Lakhiani of Mind Valley, he calls it conscious uncoupling. Oh, I've read you know, about so, that, yes. Yeah, yeah, so it's like, um, we don't have divorce here in the Philippines, which is a shame because, you know, it's like you, you have to acknowledge that sometimes couples weren't, weren't really meant to be together. What you do know? you mean there's no divorce? It's not, there's not a legal right to divorce? Nope. I think we're, we're the last country in the world or the second to the last country which has not legalized divorce. And that's because of the, the Roman Catholic Church. So what happens? Do a lot of families get annulled through the church? Well, they, they get annulled in court. Um, or they get a divorce abroad, which is not necessarily valid, but they do it. Or they just check up with someone else. You know, they're on paper, they're married to someone else, but they, they're happily married, you know, happily married with their common law spouse, you know, that kind of thing. And, and the problem only just comes up when they die. And then the real wife, the legal wife, comes in to claim even though they haven't seen each other for 30, 40 years, you know, it's, it's messed up. So you're talking about the change of consciousness to when it doesn't necessarily have to be one person win, or if I win, it means you lose. We can find a way to elevate everyone. And as you're saying that, it also made me think of something you said a little bit ago about the right to develop as a human being and how that's a human rights. And how, then another thing that you said, how we have to look at things in a holistic way, not in silos. So when you're thinking of um, the right to develop, I, my mind goes to climate change and how do we, for parts of the world that are already developed, how do we tell other parts of the world, you can't do that because if you do what we did, then it's going to affect climate change and we need to reverse climate change. Um, like there was a similar thing with, um, with COP26 where the coal production in India and China, they couldn't get agreements for them to reduce it. And it was worded as how the news worded it. It was worded as China and India wouldn't agree to do this. And I was thinking, shouldn't it be India and China? We know that's a source for your um, production that you do for a large part of the world uh, is your coal production. Uh, but the world also needs to reduce it. So we need you to re reduce it but here's how we're going to help. It's not an India and China problem. Here's how we're going to help so that your people can still develop and the world can work together on climate change. Um, does that, 
I think you were talking your one colleague and friend, the economist lawyer in Notre Dame. Are those types of issues that she deals with? Um, I think she has written. She has written about environmental issues in relation to the right to development. And um, I, I can't speak for her, but my own personal view of that is that we cannot um, de-link the current climate change negotiations from the fact of colonization. So, you know, it's like, it's from a developing country perspective, it's very unfair to be bound by these, these restrictions, which the developed countries were not bound by before climate change. You know, it's like, while it's true that China and India are the main polluters at this point, I mean, the developed countries, especially the US has had so much lead time to, to pollute the environment, you know? And it, it's been likened to like kicking away the ladder. It's like the developed countries have gotten to the top and they kick away the ladder for other countries which want, want to catch up. So I, I think that that has to be acknowledged, you know, along with all the other um, sins of colonialism, you know, the genocide, the slavery, that kind of thing. Um, I'm very troubled by what's happening in the US, you know, with the Black Lives Matter thing. And I don't quite agree about you know changing the history books, uh, canceling out what happened before. I think a more a healthier way of going about it is to acknowledge that certain things happened in the past that we we regret, we would like to make amends for, um, and then help help the developing countries. So it's like, for example, it's not enough to tell China and India stop using coal. The developed countries should help provide China and India with the technology to shift from coal to more renewable energy. That's, I 100% agree with everything. And I wish you would hear that more in the discussions, because I think that's the only way that collectively as a world, we can get through this, because it's not fair to say, one, when we, when the Western nations colonized your areas, we took a lot of the resources from you, in addition to all the other things for our development. And now we're not going to let you do that, because you can't okay, well, we have to come up with together as another way for you to still develop and prosper, for you to, um, you know, the, the countries that are blessed with the rainforest, okay, you're making money by tearing them down. We have to make sure that you make more money by preserving them. And that is not your obligation to figure it out by yourself. This is, this is if it's not being clear in how I'm saying it, this is my opinion. Um, it's the world's obligation to pay you to make sure that you can do that. I just remembered something. Um, so it's like at the global integrative law gathering, um, I was wondering if there are people who are working in the field of international law because international law is one area that could really benefit from integrative law um, from a holistic approach. Um, I was in a lecture recently. We had a guest professor from um, I think he, he's a Sri Lanka national. His name is An Anthony Angi. Um, very prominent, uh, one of the founders of third world approaches to international law. Um, so as, a, as someone from Sri Lanka, you know, with a developing country perspective and growing up in Australia and Singapore, which is more of a developed country perspective, um, he was able to see law from different perspectives. Um, and he, he told us during his lecture that Colonization is embedded in international law. International law, as we understand it now, carries with it the vestiges of colonization. And we need to change the consciousness if we're going to change the law. So, for example, um, like for example, I think the sustainable development goals, and um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the Great Reset. Um, the World Economic Forum uses that language. It seems to be more of the same though. It's like um, development is the responsibility of certain states, certain NGOs, certain corporations. Um, it strikes me as very el elitist, you know. It's like certain people being responsible for the development of everyone else. And there is another model. Um, I've heard of the contrast, the Great Awakening, um, wherein people awaken to the consciousness that we, we only have one planet, we are one human family. Yeah. We are all bound yeah. inextricably together. And all of us have to work together to solve this problem. You know? And I think that, that model, more than the Great Reset, 
um, the Great Awakening fits in more, more, more beautifully, I think, with you know integrated law because you know it's founded on human rights. Um, every person has human rights by virtue of the fact that they're human. You don't need to demand human rights from the government. You you deserve human rights because you are by the mere fact that you are born a human being. You know, and everyone should be able to participate in that. You know, so th this is where you know the importance of the, the democracy comes in. Freedom of information comes in. Mm -hmm. um, the principle of subsidiarity, like for example, why should the national government determine what happens in a small barrio? Shouldn't it be the inhabitants of that small town or that small you know municipality determine what sh should work for them because they live there and they will be the ones directly affected by their decisions. In the Philippines, is it just a national law? Do the local barrios or the local towns have a say in their own local laws? Like, are there, are, is there a division between local and federal like there is in the US? I just don't know. Um, we're, we're a unitary system. So it's still pretty much the national government, but our local governments have um, can have a say, you know, they can pass their own legislation, their own ordinances. And yeah. the issue of federalism is a long-standing issue because before Spain came, we were really a, a collection of different nations, mm. you know, and our nations are divided along the lines of our ethnicity and our linguistics, our language, you know, and, and the different ethno-linguistic groups have different ways of thinking, different ways of doing things, you know, so people have been toying around with the idea of federalism for a very long time. Um, and it's counterculture because it's like we were unitary and it's just going to splinter us further. Um, but I think the main issue, whether it's a unitary or a federal system, is can we talk to each other? Can we have conversations where we, um, you know, we acknowledge each other's positions and even if we disagree, we can try to find common ground. Um, we haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, we inherited the American democratic system, but we are still very much authoritarian in how we conduct our families, how we raise our children. I see. Um, and so that's that's a particular challenge I have, trying to teach democracy how to get, you know, law schools and law professors to model democracy in how we conduct our classes and how we teach our students. Which is something that you had mentioned earlier about um reshaping law education in the Philippines. Do you want to talk about that? You had um, the Legal Education Advancement Program. Yes. So it's um it's a new project um, that's, so I, I've been a consultant for the Legal Education Board, and I'm also a professor at the University of the Philippines. And so the Legal Education Board is the regulator. Um, I understand it's a different system. In the United States, the law schools aren't regulated by the government. Uh, here it is. And um, so the Legal Education Board is funding um, a large capacity building program because we're adopting a new curriculum um, starting next school year. And the curriculum is significant because it reduces the academic load by at least 20 units. Um, so it provides more breathing space for the students because before it was like at least 154 units across four years. Uh, which is quite heavy when you think about it. And law school is heavy enough by itself. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the students, of course, are very stressed. Uh, they hardly have any time to, to rest, to study, to have a social life. And we're hoping that creating more breathing space in the curriculum at least gives them the rest that they need to learn the law better. And then aside from that, we're also introducing clinical legal education, um, making, um, you know, creating a mechanism for the law schools to create legal aid clinics where the students can help um, you know, poor indigent clients, um, represent them in court, uh, help them with their documents. And you know, it, it will give the students practical training in the law while also sensitizing them, you know, exposing them to the problems of ordinary people yeah. and helping them realize that the law is a tool to help people and help them solve the problem. It's a wonderful program. Um, my law school had legal, uh, had clinical programs. It had a few different types of clinics, and I did the trial clinic, which worked with um, 
the legal aid in matters, a lot of family matters, and then a mediation clinic. So in, in they were valuable experiences. So I think it's a good. Well, I don't think they were mandatory. They were elective courses that you can take. So not everyone had to do it. In your program, would they be elective or would it be everyone has to take one type of clinic before graduation? I think everyone has to take one kind of clinic. And the Supreme Court also is making that a requirement to admission to the bar. So oh. they should have completed the clinic as part of their education so that they, they're qualified to sit for the bar. Okay. Now, as we're talking, but before I go on from this, is there anything else you want to talk about this program or your um, vision for it? Um, what's exciting about it is that it's, it's a well-funded project and we, we plan to um, create like a Coursera type offering or imagine a YouTube channel full of different videos um, because we've been so um, stuck on the Socratic method of teaching, mm. like um, in the paper chase. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's taken on a life of its own here in the Philippines. And, you know, people who've gone to Harvard say, oh, we, we've stopped doing that a long time ago. And people still do it here. And I, unfortunately, many teachers don't know how to do it well. So it becomes a, a tool for bullying, honestly. Yeah. I, my law school still used the Socratic method, and you could tell, though, the um, when it's done well, when a professor does, uh, it was like a joy, like I learned so much in that class. When it's not done well, it is just, you know, but the, I think it was my first amendment professor, Professor David Goldberg, he, like, how he tied in the questions and brought in what we read in this class, this case, but then tied it in with what we read a few months ago and how he led the students through it. As long as I wasn't on call myself, I thoroughly enjoyed it. When it was your turn to be on call, it was, oh goodness, I don't remember what I read three months ago. How do I tie that in? Um, but uh, if any anyway, Professor Goldberg was in, I very much enjoyed his classes and how he used it. But you're right, when it's not used in that way it can be very intimidating and, and coupled with the authoritarian nature of the philippines you know mm. it's it's heavily patriarchal in the sense that oh you know i'm your father listen to me um there's still a lot of you know it's like children should be seen but not heard mm. you can't answer that there's still a lot of that yeah. you know um it, it's changing it's changing but um we still have a lot of that and um you know you see it in the political systems you see in it in the subservience of employees to their employers. So we have to try to, to break that. But using the Socratic method um, in the classroom, and if it's wielded by a professor who does not necessarily have the student's best interests at heart, or maybe he does, but he still has such a big ego that like it's all about him. Yeah. You know, um, it, it, it's not good. And so I'm, I'm my my thinking is that. We want to show law professors that there are other ways of teaching. And there are many people who are innovating here in the Philippines. And we'd like to do something similar. And actually, Carrie, I have to thank you for inviting me to do this because, you know, after I, you know, after your invitation, I said, maybe we can do this for, for the LEAP program, ah. you know? So maybe we will have podcasts, you know, where we talk to professors and they talk about their experiences in the classroom and, you know, people oh, can learn from that. And sharing different yeah. ways in the classroom. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah um, so thank you for that idea. Oh, you're welcome. Well, thank Kim. She's the brainchild of um, Integrative Lawyers of the World podcast. So being from the Philippines and the Catholic nature of this, I think you'll appreciate one of my law school professors, Professor Shipman. He, so he taught, um, I had him for torts. And if you answered incorrectly, he did it such, um, his response was so encouraging. He's like, you're in the right church, just the wrong pew. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyways, <laughs> and I just always, for some reason, that always just stayed with me. You're in the right church, just the wrong pew. It's okay. It's okay. You're doing good. Let's keep trying. And I think one of the times I was like, I, I'm like, I'm not in the right church. I don't even think I'm in, in the right, you know, city. I'm like in the wrong neighborhood. I was so off course, but he was very encouraging. Um, so, so as we were talking and 
you know, you shared all of, a lot of your experiences, you're a well-respected law professor, you um, consult on high profile cases and matters of public concern and public policy. And yet, when I sent you the email asking you to be a part of um, Integrative Lawyers of the World, your initial response was, what? <laughs> what was um, I don't think this is for me. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you think that? So, you know, um, I only got um, introduced to the rest of the integrative law movement last July during the global gathering. And, you know, all the other lawyers had done so many interesting things, you know. And it's like, even you, Carrie, I was looking at your, your background. It's like, oh my gosh, my background's nowhere as interesting as Carrie's, you know, let alone Kim's or everyone else, you know. And I felt that I was just coming into integrative law as a newbie. So when you messaged me, I didn't think there was that much to contribute because it's only now in talking to you that I realized that maybe I was practicing integrative law long ago, but I just didn't have the language for it. And I asked you to share this because I think a lot of people have that feel, like myself included, that the imposter syndrome and how it sometimes blocks us from seeing um, all that we do, all that we are, or it could like, you know, so I'm glad that you took the time to um, reply and to share that with us today because as i'm sitting here and as you're sharing this i'm thinking wow how did i get to interview such an amazing person you know i haven't done any of these like amazing things and here i am interviewing you so we all have that and it's nice to i think by here and if anyone's listening to this has ever felt why me or i don't belong here maybe you do Maybe you do. Do you know the, the story of the contest between the sun and the wind? Have you heard of that? I have heard of it, but I don't remember it. Okay. So basically, so the sun and the wind were, you know, having a contest, you know, some friendly rivalry like you in Ohio and Michigan or something, you know. And so they, they saw this man who was, you know, carrying a winter, he was wearing a winter coat. And, um, you know, they were, Com they were competing to see who would be able to get the coat off the man, you know. So the wind tries first. Oh, I'm going to, you know, make, I'm going to blow it so hard that I'm going to blow it off him, you know. And no matter how hard the wind blows, the man only just, you know, hugs the coat closer to him, you know. So in the end, the wind fails. And then the sun just simply shines, you know, just gently first and then hotter and hotter until finally the man feels that he has to remove the coat on his own. You know? And so I share that story because I think if we are going to change the power structures, if we're going to change international law, um, or even our contracts, or you know, how, we do, how we do law, how we solve our conflicts, the change has to come from us. We have to be that change. You know? so, if we are to awaken consciousness in other people, we have to be conscious ourselves. We have to model these things and we have to make it attractive enough for people, for example, to let go of their fear, to let go of their need to control, you know? And we can draw inspiration, for example, from Mahatma Gandhi, from Martin Luther King Jr., um, Nelson Mandela, you know? They all modeled a new way of thinking, you know, a, an elevated level of consciousness where they did not meet the power structures head on, but they did it in creative ways. They modeled justice. Um, they tried to be compassionate towards their enemies. You know, so I, I really think that Jesus was so wise in, in what he teaches in the Bible. You know, um, you know, pray for your enemies, you know, um, be kind to your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that kind of thing. Um, and Martin Luther King said that. Hate cannot drive out hate. You know, only love can do that. So if we get sucked into that narrative where we have to, you know, we have to fight against the power structures, where we have to dangle something, um, we get sucked into that duality, you know, which is what we've been inhabiting, I guess, for the last what, thousand, two thousand years. You know, how human consciousness has been 
mired in conflict and you know, win-lose. If we believe that a better way is possible um, and we model it, you know, but first we have to believe it. You know, first we have to believe it and we have to do what we can to make it happen in our sphere, then it can emanate outward. And, you know, and structures, systems, they're made up of small moving parts like us. It's not a monolith, although it may seem like it is. Um, there are obviously very powerful people at the top of the structures, but going back to the right to development and people's participation, there are 7 billion of us on this planet. You know, and you know, if everyone awakens to their power, awakens to a new consciousness where they take active roles to shape their destiny, you know, I think we can shift the system. I think so too. And I think that's a great place to end our conversation today. Um, so thank you so much for being part of Integrative Lawyers of the World. It was really an interesting conversation full of insight and um, curiosity and just learning. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carrie, for the opportunity. I enjoyed their conversation. <laughs>